Okay, thanks for checking this out. We're reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. This is chapter two. If you don't have this book, it's an easy read. Financial literacy, investing in real estate. Get a copy. It's 18 bucks. Read chapter one, read chapter two, and then watch this video after you read chapter two, which is called Why Teach Financial Literacy. Great chapter, some amazing stuff to go over. Read chapter two and jump on this. I'm going to pass this over to Chris to start. Here you awesome. go. What jumped out to you in this chapter? There we go. So a couple of things jumped out to me in this chapter. One, they're talking about the measure of wealth. And they're talking about it being the person's ability to survive X amount of days moving forward. If you stopped working, how long could you survive? And then that is your measure of what your wealth actually is, which is really interesting. Do you want me to hold it or are you okay? Oh, it's all right. I got it. I got right. it. It's okay. Thanks, buddy. Um, the other thing was they were talking about using assets. So I'm always buying things that I think are fun. And how do I spend my money on that? He's a drummer. It's, He's it's a drummer. the money. I'm a drummer. I spend my money on musical stuff. <laughs> and that's the whole thing. So in this, they're talking about using assets. So instead of him just going and buying a new drum set, he's looking at getting assets that then give him more value to be able to buy said drum set with. So it's a different, it's a bit of a mind change to go and, and look at it that way. The last thing that I really thought stuck out to me is talking about the educational system. I know we talked about this a little bit last time, but he's talking to his teacher and saying, why don't we learn about finances and money in school? And the teacher says, don't worry about money. Don't worry about that. You worry about your education right now. And then down the road, you'll make the money. The issue with that is, yeah, but then down the road, I still don't know about money. So now I've got the education and I've got the job that's bringing me money. Maybe I do have an asset or two, but I don't know how to manage that money. And I don't know how that's going to work. And that's an issue. And that's, it's really interesting because that's what the book I'm assuming is going to start talking about. Again, I haven't read this book yet. I'm new on this and I'm, I'm excited to see where they go with that info. Zach. What are you thinking, hey, buddy? Hey. Um, so there's a couple key takeaways for me. Uh, one of them is he uses the analogy of most people building a skyscraper on a slab of the American, or in our case, the Canadian dream. So what they mean by that is we go get an education, we go get a big mortgage, and we start to build this big monstrous life, building a skyscraper on a foundation that was only ever poured and intended for a single family house. And so, it, I mean, it works for us because we're in real estate. But what he's talking about is you keep loading more and more weight, more and more debt on top of just a small little foundation. And what that does is it creates instability the higher we go. And I mean, you think about how many people you got a mortgage, you got a car payment, maybe you got some student loans. Um, and you're completely reliant on having to get raises or to keep working to sustain that income. And that segues into my second point is he talks a little bit about good debt versus bad debt. And I'll be honest, I forgot that I came up with this or that I found this concept in this book. I thought it came from somewhere else. So it's mind shattering, but there's such a thing as good debt. And good debt is self-liquidating, meaning that somebody else pays it. So perfect example for us is rental real estate. You can owe the bank a half a million dollars, but if a tenant is making all the payments, that's actually good debt because you're you're not you're on the hook for the loan, but as long as you keep that property full, you're going to pay back all of that and get to keep the extra that's left over. Um, so many people are willing to go out and get uh, more a car loan for 70 grand to get a brand new pickup but they're not willing to borrow 70,000 to start a business or to put 70,000 down on a on a property. You know, that to them that seems risky, but it's far riskier to borrow a money on a vehicle with zero down and then have to come up with 700 a month for the next 5 years. So, those are the two big concepts in this chapter that just totally rock my world and and continue to to this day. Nice. Okay, where are we at? Four and a half minutes. We're trying to keep these things relatively short. Um, for myself, I have some notes here. There were a bunch of examples given of ultra wealthy business leaders and folks that had amassed huge incomes that ended up losing it all. And also examples of, you know, multimillionaire NBA players that end up blaming their lawyer and their accountant and saying their friends, everyone took advantage of them and they've got no money left and they're completely broke which is sad, 
The flip side is there are also lots of stories of people that have gone bust and then made a fortune again. I don't think these things are a fluke. They've learned a system. They've learned the rules. They've educated themselves on what to do to create wealth, etc. The rich, this is something that Rich Dad would always tell them, these boys when they're the young boys that this story is about. The rich acquire assets and the poor and middle class acquire liabilities that they believe are assets. And that's the difference. We touched last week briefly on the bank. We'll tell you your house is your biggest asset. Well, breaking it down simply, and we're going to look at a quick cash flow um, breakdown in a minute. Assets put money in your pocket liabilities take money out of your pocket simple as that so a bank is only putting your house as an asset on a big sheet that they call your personal wealth statement what it really is is how much do we want to loan this person because if they don't pay us how much do they have that we can take that's what they want it on there it's it's an asset to them because it's something they're going to own if they're lending you money so it's just sizing you up for how much debt to give you um there's a story of a young couple who got married, their apartment was too small for them. And so they said, you know what, let's buy a house. They both ended up getting their career started, down payment for a house, then along came the kids, then along came new furniture and doing rentals and this and that and credit card debt and on and on. And it just kept on ballooning until the fun that they would have in life at the apartment together is completely replaced by all this debt and just didn't work out. Um, no, I shouldn't say it didn't work out. It's a lot where a lot of people are sitting. And then page 90, I really like that page 90 talks about who you actually work for, um, which is you work for your three people, your company, you work for the government, all your taxes, and you work for the bank. That's where your money goes. And for a lot of people, that's it. So let's look quickly at these cash flow patterns. So this is three different cash flow patterns. Thank you very much, Ashley. Or... An income statement, which is simple. Here's your income, here are your expenses. What's a balance sheet? It's looking at the balance between your assets, true assets, and liabilities. Okay, so this is an income statement of a poor person, middle class, where I think most people sit, which is the reason that we're doing these videos, and a rich person. Income statement for a poor person. Here's your job, get paid your salary, it goes into the income bracket, into expenses, tax, rent, food, transportation, clothes, that's it. Nothing's going to your balance sheet. It's just in and out, rat race. Uh, middle class person, here's your salary, it's coming in. Can they see that from there? Should I bring it closer or no? Let me just try. I'm just scared people won't be able to see what I'm talking about. I'm just gonna be some idiot pointing at a screen. Um, income comes in, it's going to pay for your liabilities because you have your mortgage, car loans, credit card debt, student loans, whatever else it might be. So your cash comes in, pays for those liabilities. From liabilities, it goes to your expense column and it's out the door. Again, goose egg, nothing in the assets. Okay, so the cash flow statement of a rich person, they have assets they've invested in, real estate, stocks, bonds, notes, intellectual property, or a business that you're not actually working on the day to day. You have people in place and the business is running on its own or you're buying yourself a job. It's not actually an asset according to the thinking of this book. And these assets, are putting income into the income column of your income statement. And then it just keeps going, it keeps building. It's like a tree, you've got some deep roots and it just keeps growing on its own. So those are the those are the three different cash flow patterns for um, yeah, where, where folks are at. Do you guys have any last uh, comments, thoughts, comments? No, I think it's great. I look forward to seeing where this goes. It's starting to set up what seems like a, a foundation, like Aaron says, planting the tree. And I'm really excited to see how they're going to piece all that together as we move through the book. Yeah, so. I mean, I just, I, I know we've been real estate heavy in this because it's our chosen vehicle. But he also talks a little bit in this chapter about people, you know, the middle class. It's not like people don't invest at all, but most people just choose mutual funds as their their vehicle you can go into the branch you can buy them you know you say i want a little bit of stock but the thing that you need to think about when you're choosing a mutual fund is an mer that's a management expense ratio yeah. what that is is it's how much they're charging you to manage your money so it's usually a percentage and it'll be pre an mer will be say 2.7 percent what's the, what that means is if it's 2.7 percent if they invest your money and you make 10%, they're taking 2.7 off the top and giving you the rest. So something to keep in mind for those of you that 
real estate might not be the right vehicle. Interesting. If it was 10%, they're only taking 2.7, you still make eight for doing nothing. That's not bad. Yeah. But I think a lot of times it's not that, not well, exactly mean, the case. Yeah. What about the flip side? If the market goes down 10%, they're still taking 2.7. So you're actually going to be down 12.7. Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. rain or shine, they're still taking their bucks, man. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Cool. Chapter two, looking forward to discussing chapter three. And if you don't have... Well, if you watch this video, you read the chapter already or you're going to be bored because you're not going to know a lot of things what we're referring to. But looking forward to chatting with you next week. Cool. Ashley, any final thoughts over there? No. Okay, we're good. Thumbs up. Absorbing. Absorbing.